as I mentioned before, we have DJ Equal in the studio. Give it up for him. He's here. Thank Look you. Look at this guy. Look at this guy. Thank you to all my fans in the stadium. They love you. For me. That's right. That's right. They do love me. Oh, oh someone whistled. Okay. Yo, DJ Equal, thank you for being here on yes, the Tony Podcast. And your song sounds super tight. Thank you so much. Um, for all you YouTube people, we just played his track, uh, Forget My Love. You got to go peep that. It's real dope. And um, yeah, we want to learn about DJ Equal, the life and times. Yes. Um, like I said before, he's a you know bi-coastal DJ. He lives in LA now, but um, you are from originally Asheville. North Carolina. North Carolina, That's which is right. like a very special place, right? It's not like a normal um, North Carolina city. No, it's definitely a, a special little oasis. Yeah. It's a valley surrounded by three beautiful mountain ranges. It has an amazing music scene and food scene and art scene. Uh, Tight. You know, it's a it's a super liberal place for the It's kind of like a hippie town-ish, right? Or Absolutely. No? Similar yeah. to like Austin, Texas or, yeah, or Burlington, or Vermont. Okay. Or, yeah, Portland, Oregon Tight. for sure. That's dope. And so from there, you ended up moving to New York. Yeah, I moved to New York pretty much as soon as I could. Uh, you know, I dropped out of high school to start DJing yeah. for underground hip hop artists when I was 17. Oh, crazy. And then, yeah, when by the time I was 19, I moved to New York and kind of just hustled my way into the scene there and yeah. did whatever it took to get by and until totally. I found my way. Yeah, that's where I met you in New York. Mm -hmm. I don't remember how we met exactly, but... A long ass time ago, <laughs> it was yeah. I remember you had the the little John Rockbox collab <laughs> CD with you. It was like the first thing you did was hand me one of those. I was like, cool, sweet. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So for all you guys that don't know, I did a. I used to do these mixtapes with little John called Rockbox. We did an all eighties mixtape and an all rock mixtape, and we used to do a two by four like four turntable show and. Uh, yeah, all that. Shout to little John. What up, son? Um, but that's funny. Yeah. I mean, we, I remember coming to New York and going to see AM with you yeah, and for like sure. all types of stuff. Um, so, so, but you were DJing in Asheville. Like you said, you were DJing for underground hip hop artists. Yeah. Pretty much just like got into, pretty much got into scratching first when I first started DJing right. it was just teaching myself how to scratch. Eventually like got some of the like, uh, you know, turntable TV videos and stuff like that yeah. and just kind of watch them and figure it out. And I just got good at it really fast. Uh, I think cause probably from playing drums my whole life. Right. Right. It, scratching just made sense musically yeah, for me it's like really percussion. fast. So then I just kind of like started hanging around the local hip hop scene. I was really young. I was like 15, 16 and started getting to open up at the sh local hip hop shows. Uh, you know, really awesome. There was, there was a great scene at that time and they were bringing in, you know, living legends yeah. and hieroglyphics and atmosphere and the whole rhyme sayers thing and the Anticon oh. and Sage Francis and super underground stuff. But anyways, eventually yeah. some rappers would show up. Yo, chill. Sorry. Some rappers <laughs> <laughs> I was getting hyped. You know, oh my God. End up in town with no DJ and just have like a couple of the records that had the instrumental on it and like right. a CD with the other beats. And I yep. somehow I just got the opportunity uh, not somehow, I was DJing, that's right, I was DJing for a local rapper as well. And I just got the opportunity to DJ for some of these guys. Dope. And then eventually, um, that was how I got the opportunity to to go on the road doing it. And what, would you like go to Europe with them and stuff? Or? Yeah, after doing a couple uh, US tours, I had the opportunity to go to Europe a few years in a row. Dope. And then that kind of dried up and I just hit up all the contacts I had from doing that for a few years and kind of just, not, yeah, pretty much like faked it. Like, hey, I'm, I'm, what, I'm, I'm on my gigs? way back out there. Uh, you know, that party that you took me to, I don't know you know, if you're interested. Oh, when are your dates? So I'm like, oh, I could be there between this week and that week. And right. like, oh, we'd love to have you. Tight. And then just started going back out uh, solo. Yeah. yeah. And then, and then came to... back and oh, moved to New York, came back to New York. Like, what's up, international DJ? Right. You know? Well, that's what I was going to ask. So, so because similar to me, like, I never DJed in a club or wanted to DJ in a club. For so long, I, I wanted to be like DJ Premier, Babu, and just be the scratch DJ and yeah. tour with the groups and same thing. Um, when did you start getting into that scene, like in New York, or were you DJing that, parties in Asheville? I was DJing parties in Asheville. Okay. But I just, you know, I was so young that I didn't really have a concept of right. even what other DJs were playing in yeah. clubs and at parties. So 
I mean, it's so funny to think about it. I remember like, you know, tapping out the BPM and riding with a, you know, riding the BPM on the record sleeve. Yeah. And like the peak of my night would always be around like 104, 106 BPM. And like past that, I'd be like, I don't even For know sure. where to go from here. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Because also I wasn't at this time, you know, I want to age myself, but there wasn't really like 70 beats per minute music happening. No. That was getting played at all. You know what I mean? No, not at all. There, no, there'd same the, thing. There'd be the one random big pimp in or something, but like it just wasn't a thing. Right. And you would just like turn your record So yeah, off so it was definitely it, it was definitely moving to New York and like getting, you know, taking whatever gig I could. Well, that's what like I was my wondering. Fir- my first what were gig some of your ever. First ones? I, my first yeah. gig ever in New York. I can't remember the place the name of it, but it was like an Irish pub on <laughs> Bowery and 4th Street or Bowery okay. and 3rd Street right by the Bowery Hotel. Yeah. And I had to bring I had to bring all my, you know, bring records, obviously, turntables, yeah. mixer. I had a discman that I brought because the owner was like, all right, so we need a little bit of everything, hip hop, rock, 80s. And I was like, cool. And I'm thinking in my mind, like, I have hip hop. So like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I just you know, records. It's like, what are you going to do? Yeah. And, and I just to be honest, like everything I was DJing up to that point was mostly, you know, hip hop related and not even really like commercial party hip hop stuff. Yeah. To, you know underground and some party rocking stuff but anyways i had to very quickly you know and i I learned that night how underprepared i was to be djing in manhattan and i was 19 years old also you know but i literally pulled out with the disc and beep you know playing like (laughs) the 80s joints that i didn't have and just kind of like fumbled my way through it yeah you know you got to do what you got to do to like get the music but i was so stoked and, and like still to this day Every time I take the ride, whether I'm coming from the airport or for whatever reason, whenever I go over the Williamsburg Bridge from uh, Brooklyn into Manhattan, like yeah. I, I almost always think about that first gig and how excited I was with, with every. It was dumping. It was yeah. It was so cold. It was snowing. You know, it was winter, and I couldn't have been happier. I was going to make the littlest amount of money ever. Yeah, but I just couldn't believe it that I was. On my way to DJ in Manhattan, solo DJ equal gig. Yeah, that's tight. And the gig was whatever. It was it was not that amazing, but it didn't yeah, matter. Yeah, but I mean, there's a million places in New York, and you got to start somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, no one on this show has had an amazing. No, and they first were like, gig. and they were like, great job. And I think I played there a couple more times, and it yeah. ended up you know meeting other DJs that way and got right. more gigs. But know? eventually, you got into like the bottle service scene and whatever, all that kind of. Yeah, so I was I was throwing parties uh, under the name Taste NYC with my buddy Joey Rubin, and we were just throwing kind of like conceptual club nights um, in the Lower East Side. Yeah, and uh, we were doing that. You know, we had a Wednesday party for like, over a year, and it was amazing. And we were, you know, bringing in awesome DJs and performers for some of their first times in New York, and uh, eventually. You know, having to promote a party week after week is really tiring. Yeah. And it's like at the end of an amazing party, when it when when the clock would hit four a.m., you immediately would start thinking about the next week, what you were going to do, how you're going to get people in there. You know, and it's crazy. I yeah, at that time, I just started getting my first opportunities to leave the Lower East Side and and go play the, the kind of like bottle service, meat packing district type stuff, and it was great. And it was you know, it was it was also a new experience and tough and had to learn a lot really quickly to yeah. to do a good job and it was a whole nother world of dealing with managers and owners to a you know a level that I never experienced before right and you're in New York so I'm it's still like in my, hardcore you know, I'm in my early 20s like yeah. yeah it's hardcore and you know some people knew me but I was also new to most people so just tr- you know trying my best to like show up and show out and but also you know not you know feel myself too hard and yeah see what I can make happen. That's dope. And then eventually you started, like I said before, like you've DJ, you're like, when I talk to you, you'll be like, I'm in, I don't know, Romania or whatever. Like you've sure. DJed so many crazy countries. Like shout out to Romania, sort of like parlay that out from the New York gigs. Or, yeah. I mean, and your past contacts. It, like yeah. Said. It was, it was a combination of meeting people from overseas when they would come to New York. Yeah. And also yeah, those literally those initial relationships I made so long ago in Europe, you know, you meet one person and then you'd go back and I'm like, oh, we're not, you know, I quit DJing. Now I own a graphic design business. But my friend, you know, has this club and wherever in Frankfurt, yeah. let me introduce you. And then you go there and you play the club and you do a good job and you make friends with that guy. And he's like, oh, I'd love to introduce you to my friend in Romania, you know, right. et cetera. And put together and, a little and, and Europe sp- tour. Out. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's tight. And in New York, you also like, you know, I know you produce, you play music, you do all that stuff. And I used to go hang with you at um, the Knox studio. Yeah. Heavy rock music. The yeah. Knox studio for sure. So shout to the Knox. Um, but you, what was it like working out of there? Did you meet a lot of people? Was it helpful to oh, your It was amazing. Career? Yeah, it was great. And when I first started there, the Knox were mostly producing hip hop artists and they had just begun oh, wow. producing it was the first artist that they had like taken under their wing um, and, were, and were producing his whole project. And his name is Samuel. And I was in there recording mixtapes and I just ended up hanging out there more and more like before and after the sessions. Yeah. And I was kind of harassing them to get a drum set in there so I could record myself playing drums. And finally I got the call and I knew it was drum related somehow. And B-Rock hit me up and I was like, did you get the drum set? He's like, we did, but also... We're putting the, the band together for Samuel, our artist. Do you want to audition to be the drummer? I was like, yeah. for sure. Audition, got the job. And like for years, me, the Knox, and Samuel were like a touring act. He was he was signed to Columbia as a pop artist. and Yeah, I remember that. And then pretty much, you know, things changed as they do. The Knox kind of started doing their own thing. And I became a permanent tenant of Heavy Rock Studios. And yeah, it was amazing. There was all types of musicians in and out of there all the time. And just having, you know, people, having friends who are awesome producers to kind of not just guide you, but like, you know, peek into the, your session and be like, ah, uh, you know, I would probably change that hi-hat. Yeah. And snare. And, you know, you might as well just, you know, start a new song right now. <laughs> <laughs> or come and be like, yo, this is dope. Definitely keep going down this path like you're on to something. Right. It was priceless. Absolutely. Yeah, just to be around them and get the inspiration and then also For get sure. the knowledge and... Yeah, definitely just hanging, hanging out, fly on the wall with them. I learned a lot. That's so dope. Yeah, I l learned a lot from Samuel, too, who learned from them. So it was it was awesome. I miss those guys. Yeah. Yeah, they're, I mean, they're killing it now still. So Show. good. Making a lot of commercial music, too. <laughs> I mean, their music literally, is in commercials. Literally in commercials, yeah. <laughs> like, um, yeah, killing killing the game, the knocks. Um, that's tight. And you, um, like, you got, you ended up, you know, you keep producing and doing your things and you've been getting different features on your songs and you had Gyptian mm -hmm. on one of your songs. Yep. How did you get him on there? Like some of the other features, like, you know, how do you get the people on there? Like, what's the process? Well, you know, that that's another cool thing about having that studio space was like for my most recent song, Forget My Love, the vocalist on that is this dude, uh, Josh Moriarty, who's the the lead man for Miami Horror, this really cool oh, yeah. indie dance group from great. Melbourne, Australia. Anyways, he and I ended up getting linked up because their band's manager at the time knew me and knew that I had a studio, knew that he was in town with Time to Kill, and he heard my productions before and thought that we would gel musically. So, you know, he just connected us and he pulled up and we did it in a day pretty much. That's crazy. Um and then every, yeah, it's, it's been completely organic features like that or just yeah. friends. Right. Until Egyptian. <laughs> Egyptian, I did not know before um, my single Contact Eye featuring Egyptian. And that song, I had already produced it and written it with a friend. It was kind of more of an R&B song. And I was just on my laptop one night, as, as we are, literally just like, you know, switching between Amazon and Facebook, just killing time, like right. bullshitting. And I saw a homie who I, online on Facebook, you know, talking about uh, dance hall features available. And it was really to get a dub plate. You know, these were artists who had songs out. And if you wanted to get a dub plate with your name on it, yeah. hit him up. You know, he was going to hook it up. Yeah, like a famous song with your name. Long story short, I hit there. him up. And yeah, and I said, hey, I'm not looking for a dub plate, but I have the song. It's done. I'm looking to get a feature on it. Um, do you think any of the, these guys would be interested yeah and initially he was like no it's just this is not a thing yeah he was like okay Don't you know play totally. he's like but who do you have uh who do you have in mind and i gave him a, you know a couple names and it didn't end up working out and he said well what do you think about egyptian i said well egyptian's dope he has a dope voice he has hits you know yeah. what i'm saying and uh and egyptian immediately agreed he, he dug the vibe dug the song that's so dope and uh, and yeah, we we made it happen. It's fire. I, fire. Unfortunately, I still haven't met the dude, but <laughs> you know, he he recorded the vocals in in Jamaica and, and sent them through. And 
I went to uh, New York and worked with uh, Dylan McDougal at Off Record Music, and he helped me do some magic. And I, yeah, I'm super happy with the way the way the song came out. Yeah, it came out really dope. That was uh, the, yeah, that, that that was the last single I released on the Knox uh, label, Heavy Rock Music. Oh, okay, yeah. And your newest ones on Calabasas, Calabasas. yeah, Calabasas Records, new indie label out of LA. Tight. That Calabasas life. That's right. That's dope. And um, so when you were in New York, like, I mean, I know I have so many insane stories just from, like you said, crazy managers yelling at me or celebrities yeah. or I don't know. I remember DJing at Butter and having everybody there from Madonna to like, I don't even remember. I should have written it down, but the most hectic nights of my life, you know, people Absolutely. screaming at me, do this, play this, go here, do this. Oh, you know, and you're, you're like, when's this going to end? It's five. 27 in the morning, you know, <laughs> but, um, I know you, so you, and that was just me going there once in a while. You were there every night DJing for a while. 13 years. Le that's crazy. So like, what are some of the craziest, like, did you ever have Jay-Z in the club or oh, I, had you mentioned to me you had a couple yeah, stories, yeah. right? I mean, I was fortunate. I got to play for nearly every artist and celebrity I could have ever imagined playing for. Right. Um, and that was just New York. And you yeah. never, and you really never knew who was going to show up at the club, especially no. at the more like celebi clubs. Right. It was just, you're like, oh, there's Bono. That's you what know? I'm saying. It'd be the weirdest combination. The weirdest, like, yeah. Madonna, Bono, Marilyn Manson, and Jay-Z. And yeah. you know, and you're like, okay, what All do right. I even play at this point? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> um, yeah, like Jay-Z, I've, I've had um, amazing interactions and I've had not so amazing interactions. I'll tell you both. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, one night at One Oak, yeah, with um, Jesse Marco and DJ Sinatra and me, and I don't even remember who was who was who. I don't know who was booked to play, but yeah. the three of us were just playing. We were just jamming. It was great. Jay Z pulls up. It's already a great night, and I think we. I don't know how we decided to do it, but we kind of just collectively agreed. All right, let's go two for two. Everyone gets two records. <laughs> And then we all kind of just naturally started doing like original samples into the, you know, into the song that Jay-Z used. Right. And it was just going off and it was just amazing. And then, you know, eventually it's getting late. Jay gets out of the owner's booth, booth walks, you know, towards the DJ booth and just looks up at us and gives us the strongest salute. And I was just like, oh my God, this is so amazing. Like <laughs> couldn't have asked for more. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Didn't ruin it by trying to like talk to him and get a photo or whatever. He just gave us like yeah. that sincere I'll salute. I'll take that like, salute. Right, cool. He's like, you know the samples, you know the songs, you guys killed it. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. And plus those are friends I was playing with. So it was like, it was just perfect, right? Yeah. It was not that much longer after that when I was DJing like a, a Haiti fundraiser with Solange and Jay and Beyonce were in a tiny club. Jay and Beyonce are as close to me as you are right now. Right. There's like a right tiny plexiglass window in between okay. us, you know, but they're, they're right there. And I'm yeah. like, Oh shit. You know? <laughs> and I'm playing, I'm like, I think I'm doing my thing. You know, it's not like a crazy dance bar or anything. It's just, you know, it's a, it's a fundraiser. It's a vibe. Right. And then Jay turns around, you know, looks over at me and kind of like waves me over. I'm like, Oh, it's on. Like it's Hove. He's about to dap me up. I'm killing it. <laughs> I'm made. This is it. He's like, he remembers me from last time. He's going to give me the salute, a the double same salute. salute. Double salute is coming. He's going to give me a medal of honor. Probably a rock chain. You know <laughs> yeah. what I'm He's been waiting for the right he's moment. Been, he's had in his jacket, wait, hoping to see you again. And literally, like, someone like that, you know, especially as a DJ, like, yo, when you're that close to someone and, yo, know, it's like slow motion. You're like, yo, this is crazy. Like, this is what you work for. I'm yeah. so stoked. I lean in. He's like, yo. Turn the treble down. I'm like, no, <laughs> this is not happening. And I'm like, and and to you know, to be honest, the the club, the sound system was not great. It was a trebly room. There was almost nothing you could do in that room to right. not make it feel shrill when the volume was up loud. Oh wow! So I'm just like, for sure, got you. <laughs> you know, I already had it down pretty far, so I'm like, mm, you know, a little bit. Moments later, yo, turn the treble down. I'm like, oh my god. Why does this have to be have have to be happening with Jay Z of all yeah, people? That's a nightmare. Yeah, it was actually a nightmare. <laughs> He's like, Shia. <laughs> no, he was like, no. He's like, no. Yo, <laughs> homie, you killing my ears. For yo, real. that is the worst. I mean, it's not the worst. No, but it, it, it could have been worse. Sucks. It's like, yo, that that's yeah, like that's like as a DJ, we get blamed for everything. Oh, like everything. I'll do so many events, and they're like. 
asking me everything from the lights to this to, oh, this speaker is doing this or this is doing this. And I'm like, I don't control that. I'm literally the person in charge of the music. They're like, oh, it's so weird. It's never been this dead before until you came here to DJ. And oh, yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, I for sure. It's my fault. That. I'm like, yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's like the sound things when they're like, yo, like I remember doing this, uh, some, I don't know, Toronto film festival or something. And they were like, uh, they were like, yo, the, you, can you turn the music down on that one speaker out in the patio to the right? And I'm like, I, that's not what I do. Like I just do the music. And they're like, well, Adam Levine's sitting out there and he's got a headache. And I'm like, <laughs> Good, turn can, it up. Can you bring him Advil? Like, I, I'm not a doctor. I'm here to play the songs. Like, you could go turn that off, you know. But yeah, for real. Yeah, like, I feel like we get blamed. That's the thing that sucks. Even when turntables Have you checked or, in with him to see how he's feeling? You know, I, I hit him up. He said he just took a couple uh, Bufferin, and he was all right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like, yo, what do you want me to do? I think Harvey Weinstein was there, too. I remember seeing him out there. Like, this is feeling quite Sundancey. <laughs> It was Toronto Film oh, Festival. Oh, Toronto Film Festival, yeah. They were like, yeah, I would see, I used to see him at so many things, and then it was like, it all went down. He's not around anymore. Oh, I definitely got, I was playing an agency party that he was attending at Sundance, and they're like, could you turn it down? Further down, even lower. Oh, that's they're happened like, to me Harvey too. Harvey needs to have a meeting, and I'm like watching this dude just like chat with a pal. I know. I've, I've done that at Sundance things where they're like, turn it down, turn it down. They're like, all right the movie just got bought. You know, it was like some like head of some studio and they made some deal in the back room. I'm like, all right, let me get a cut of that. It's all about <laughs> I, the Benjamins. I played the right song. So, yeah. you know, but yeah, we, we get blamed for so much shit. Like I've been in, I've been in a Nor club. Nor do we get thanked for movies being bought. <laughs> exactly. Up. Thank me for the movie deal and don't blame me for the sound. Like I had <laughs> my shit go out, like the, all the sound go out before. And the whole club just boomy. And <laughs> yes. that's happened so many times. But this time, like, it never came back on. Like, for, like, 20 minutes, people were chanting, like, we want refund. We want refund. I'm like, who even started that chant? But And also, who was is, who is refund? I guess they had to pay 20 bucks to get in. I don't know. It was, a, it, was, it was, like, in Seattle. I mean, this was a nightmare. I'm standing up there like, what the hell am I supposed to do right now? There was no mic. Like, the power was out, period. And someone had, like, pulled the fire thing or something. I don't I don't know, but finally, almost, almost out of one of my DJ anxiety dreams, but not quite. Yeah, it was. It's at the point where it is a DJ anxiety dream, but what the hell can you do? Nothing. You know what I mean? You're just like, sorry, guys. I definitely had a turning point when I realized that whenever something like that happens or, you know, my laptop hasn't shut down on me or, or crashed in forever. But if it does, the only thing you can do is not freak out about it. Right. There's, you have there's to. literally no other option. Just be super patient and chill and the crowd will, you'll recover the crowd. It's exactly. Fine. And have things ready to go if you can. You know what I mean? If you can get on the mic, get on the mic. Even if you're just like, how y'all feeling? Cool. You know, <laughs> yeah. like while your shit's restarting, have a USB stick for the, you know, CBJs I know, but sometimes you get on the mic and thinking that you're about to fix the sound within moments <laughs> and you've already started a dialogue with the crowd and then, well, at least you like have six wasted. more minutes. 10 seconds. <laughs> I know, but sometimes I, I'd rather just like let it be a mystery that anything is going wrong. Right. Assuming that I think I'm going to get back on in the next minute or two. Yeah. Which will feel like an hour or two. It's the worst. I've seen people's computers crash like on a sing-along part of a song. They're like, killing me softly. And then they just keep singing it and you're like, no, I don't think this shit's coming back. <laughs> no, like, and it's not. It's yeah. just over. <laughs> yeah, that's a nightmare. Um, what, um, yeah, I mean, there's. I've had so many like annoying things happen, you know, in that, in that world. Um, actually we were talking last night, we were telling each other's funny stories about like when those things happen to other people, how long does it take for you to step in? Like as a good Samaritan DJ that knows what's happening in a bad situation, like how, when should you step in? When's the right time? Like if I, you I see think somebody, case by case, right. Like know? if you see someone like the effects are going on the track playing and they don't realize I know, it. And it's just are going you like, nuts. yo, do you step in and stop it or tell them or like, you know, I guess it kind of depends on like how you felt about their set leading up to that point <laughs> or how good of <laughs> friends you are with them. I guess. Oh no, I'm assuming like that. I don't know the DJ, right? Like I'm going to cross that threshold and be like, Hey, I'm a random person you've never seen before. Who's going to touch your gear, <laughs> but trust me, it's for the better. You know? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it really depends. 
I remember early. If it's like ruining the club, then I, and yeah, they you, don't and, and you, they're they don't not going to figure it out. Then I'm going in. Absolutely, 100. percent It's always the easiest fix ever. It's never anything crazy. Yeah, like totally. in general, I feel like every DJ would probably agree with that. That like if something's not working, Serato's not working, the turntable isn't working. Yeah. 99 times out of 100, it's the most basic human yeah. error that you just need to correct. And help me out. I'm happy to have someone help me For out. For real. You know? But don't help me if you don't know how to fix it. Yes, don't. Like, that happened to me this weekend, actually. This guy was like, we don't usually use this box. And I was like, I don't even want to use the box, honestly, but okay. And he started just, he's, it wasn't working after one second. He started unplugging and plugging in the RCAs over and over and over. And I'm like, dog, you're overdoing it. Like if you just give me 10 seconds to look at what's happening, I'll be able to figure it out. And then I had to replug in all the shit. Like, but I've had so many weird things like that. I was at a club and I, I was like standing next to this dude and he was DJing and he had the head, both headphones on his ears, listening to the next song coming in. And I think he's listening to the other song on the, on the monitors or something. So he's like jamming out. The music's coming out of the speaker so loud. He's so into it. And you could see him mixing, like slowly mixing, but he has the volume down on the other track. And so he's using the crossfader. And then right at the part where the beat would kick in, he kicks it over to that side with no volume. Headphones and so in on. his headphones, he's yeah. hearing it. So he's going crazy jamming out and the crowd is just pure silence. They're looking up like what's happening. And so I point at him. I'm like, yo dude, it's like messed up. And he thinks I'm giving him the like, you're killing it. Like pointing he's and like, bobbing ah. my head. He's like, that's right. I'm like, no, no, <laughs> there's no sound. You know, like it's like, it's like planes, trains and automobiles. Like, you're going the wrong way. Huh? dude. And so finally, like I flick up the switch and he looks at me weird, pulls off the headphones and is like, wait, what's happening? Flicks it back to the other song. Oh, He's no. so confused. And I'm like, no, no, you were playing that. Like it was pretty bad. And then he was like, Don't. you know, you fucked up the transition when you go back to the song that was playing. before. Yeah, that's ultimate. It that, was silence for like the headphones, 15 seconds and then back to the other song. Brutal. I don't know. Have you had any situations where you had to help people? Uh, all the time, <laughs> <laughs> just endless. Well, especially nowadays, there's so many people who don't know what they're doing. DJing, I know. At least now, where where I feel like you don't have to do as many loop rolls to go between DJs. <laughs> yeah. That's still so dangerous. It's I still had to do so it. dangerous, and people still don't know how to do it. Yeah, and, and I remember one time, and it never works unless you're you can do it right away. Like for sure, I've definitely had some some. I, you know what? I, before I talk shit about myself, let me say that <laughs> I actually have some fire loop roll mixes. Yeah, under I'm my pretty belt. good at it. I, Sometimes I, I'm like, oh, I would like I want to keep this mix going. <laughs> like this loop roll transition is on point, and the crowd's dancing to it. That's fire. Yeah, but I remember in the early days of loop roll being a thing. Jusky was DJing at One Oak, and I was just chilling. He's like, Yo, equal. Come over here and do that loop roll thing. I'm like, got you, no problem. But it was, you know, at this point, I've probably still done it less than ten times in my life. You know, yeah. but I'd done it successfully. He had seen me do it. So he was like, yo, I don't want to do it. You, you come do it. You know. Yeah. So I would tap out the tempo. You know, scroll over, get it ready, whatever. I'm like, Psh, boom. I'm like, yeah, yeah. St start it. Laptop gets unplugged. The loudest USB pop. Remember, it used to always pop when you would unplug yeah. the USB. <laughs> loop roll didn't work. Dead air. One oak. 3 a.m. prime time. Oh, my God. And I just walked away. I was like, whatever, dude. You asked me. Like, I tried. <laughs> yeah. I tried my best, dude. I'm sorry. Oh, my God. And One Oak, you're like in that dungeon, dark, you know. Yeah. There's, yeah, not much room. There's a million people. It's smoky. That's crazy. And you, so you live in L.A. now, That's as right. you said. Yep. And um, you have a residency at Warwick. That's right. Every, every Saturday. Every Saturday night. And for all you guys that are not from L.A., Warwick is, like, pretty much one of the hottest clubs in L.A. It's and the hottest. Been, uh, it's the hottest, according to Equal and uh, all the owners of the club. And, <laughs> no, it's it's literally, I mean, it's it's one of the best clubs in L.A. And fully packed. Plus, it's been going for a long time. Yeah, I mean, I had been playing there every couple months um, before I moved to L.A., which was yeah. two years ago. And I've been there every Saturday since. And I think they were ahead of the curve in the sense that— um, the, like the, the, the thing to do before would be to open a club, let it go and close it, you know? And I feel like they saw that cause they were from that world, but they thought, oh, we're going to buy a space that we can keep transforming and almost re 
breathing life into it every time, right? Because yeah, it keeps the, going Warwick 1, Warwick 2, Warwick 3. It's almost like an iPhone of clubs. For sure. <laughs> and people want to come to the new version and all the new girls that just moved to LA and whatever. And when, and when you go to the other clubs, it's like, you know, having an Same. Android, you're like, damn, fam. <laughs> yeah. Not you're fun. like, damn. Yeah, it's like a test. No, it's you're cool. Like, yeah, they, they keep on redesigning the the interior right. top to bottom. I just th- thought that's like and pretty it's cool. Genius, it makes people want to come back. You know, exactly. it makes girls want to come take photos with, you know, new cool photographical, you know, photograph moments that they have. Yeah, exactly. Like I'm standing next to a suit of armor or now it's all about tropical or whatever. Or, yeah. 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 So they're on Warwick 10 now and I'm, I'm sure Warwick, Warwick 10. Yeah. Damn. And I'm sure 11's on the way because it's wow. been almost a year. Damn. And yeah, no, it's cool. It's mostly hip hop. Uh, have freedom to, to get freaky. Yeah. And eclectic, you know, here and there throughout the night. Absolutely. Which is great. Also, no one really in your ear telling you what to do. Yeah. yeah and it's packed every time. Yeah, it's packed. I mean, you drive by outside. It's it's crazy. So you're every Saturday there, and then you travel a lot, do yeah. stuff. You play tons of places in L.A., mm-hmm. and you've been doing special events and, mm-hmm. and all that stuff. Um, are there any, um, not like I want to sit, like have, uh, like you said, talk shit about yourself, but has there ever been no, a time, go, <laughs> has there ever been a time where, that you can think of, I know we've all had this, but like, that you've played a song that's just like cleared the floor that you thought was going to kill it or something that you could think of? Oh, or? of course. <laughs> all the time. Not, I, mean, well, I mean, not all the time. Not all the, the floor, time. But like right. songs fall flat. Where you think they're going to kill think it. they're going to yeah. kill. Even like the future Drake song. I remember playing it too early and being like, oh, people are not into it. You know, like. A hundred percent. You know, God, I, I was just thinking about a song that I thought was going to crush and did not, but I can't remember. Or songs anymore. like that Guatemala song where you're like, this is going to be big, and then it oh, never yeah. fully kicks in. You know, and you're like, what the hell, man? <laughs> and, and it's also, I think, just dependent on the crowd and the city that you're in. Yeah, you exactly. Know? And sometimes I'm, I definitely am guilty of playing like a Warwick banger. Right. And it might be like a Playboy Cardi song that in LA is just popping. Yeah. And you go to, you know, a, a less major city and you're like, it's 1.45 a.m. I'm feeling nice right now. Right. Crowd is definitely going to love this. Crowd definitely does not know this. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, because Warwick's very hip-hop heavy. Like It's very hip-hop heavy and the crowd is pretty knowledgeable right. pretty quickly. They're up on it. About, you know, the popping new songs. Yeah. That's crazy. And I think that's me. something we all have to remember when we travel. You know, sorry. Yeah. P- you know, w- w- going to a smaller market, just remembering that it's not cheesy to play this hit from a year and a half ago. It's actually exactly what the crowd wants and desires. Yeah, exactly. Like it's nice to be intelligent and play new shit and like have fun and try to be super creative. But sometimes you just want to rock the crowd. For sure. You know? And it's, even with DJing around other DJs, I feel like I do this and a lot of people do it where you want to impress the four DJs that are with you in the booth. Yep. And, but then sometimes the party's not as cracking, but in reality, if you just make the party cracking, then the That's DJs the are going to be impressed there. Yeah, and they're not going to go, damn, he's playing this cheesy song I would never play and it's killing it you know it's almost like play for the crowd you're there for the crowd like don't be so influenced by the DJs you know that you want to like impress them and play some weirdo beat for like five minutes and then everyone's like this sucks there's a time (laughs) you know there's a time and place for for everything yeah the most part exactly and it's cool it's the best when you get to go play a party where you can really stretch out and play some you know from super bizarre throwbacks to brand new stuff that isn't hitting yet yeah um, I know and different genres it's, it's the best and luckily I get to do that so when I'm playing a very straightforward set I just do the best job I can doing that you know and, and yeah. enjoy it and, and enjoy what the straightforward set does to people yeah you know? exactly I try to embrace whatever I'm doing like I did well I was in Vegas Friday and I'm playing a huge room and it's like I gotta play some hip hop but everything you know all together and then Saturday I do all house music and it's like I just have to find what I like within each of those things, you know, and then like make the best of it and just make people have fun. Yeah, I definitely when, when, you know, it was 2007, I guess is when kind of like indie electro and dance music really yeah. started like making an impact right. in, in America and, and, and DJ culture in our club sets. Yeah. And at first I, I remember being resistant and being like, ah, oh, like, I mean, do I really have to play this David Guetta, Kelly Rowland song? Like, right. fuck, you know? know? And then you played it 
and everyone's all right singing along, going crazy. And I'm like, this is the best. I know. I'm gonna play this every time it seems appropriate. I you know. know? And you just learn to love it. Same, you know, same way with the hip hop. A lot of us that started doing hip hop when we were younger, I feel like a lot of our peers are like, yo, hip hop sucks now. Hip hop's trash. There's, you know, I listen to golden era hip hop, right. real boom bap. And it's like, yeah, I, I still listen to it on my own time, but it's not fun for people now. And I want to play fun stuff that makes people have a good time. Even if it's not the most conscious, right. you know, celebrating love, diversity, and, you know, standing up for doing the right thing. It's fun music, current, yeah. current hip hop. Like I love it. Yeah, I, exactly. I love the most ignorant hip hop. Yeah. It's totally. the most fun. That's what that's I spent what it's made for. So many years of my life listening to common sense. Right. You know, preach to me and I was there to listen, you know, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Like that was great. But like now's not the time for that. For right. me personally. And there's a time and a place you get to play those records and those things. But for sure. But yeah, in the club, don't force it down. Play for the girls. Yeah. Play for the girls. That's yeah. what we were talking about with politic last week. He had some good quotes. That's DJing one oh one. That <laughs> yes. is the first thing. That's I it. Know. I know. Well, that's, uh, I, I said to him last week, that's what AM used to say to me too. Like play for the girls. I'm playing for the girls. You know, like, I mean, we used to go see AM a ton. But like, he would play for the girls, but he would also he hook it up for the DJs. He was a master of playing for the girls. Yeah, but, but you're right. And he would impress the DJs with the scratches, but he was still playing for the girls and and then yeah. incorporating the scratches somehow. And like, and he somehow, was the master so, of having it all some together. acapella that you never knew existed. Oh yeah, always. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But th but that would work for the girls. Right. And you're just like, all right, I give up. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, it was like he was constantly practicing and working at all times. So crazy. Um, well, yeah. So so you have this song, Forget My Love, out right now on yep. Beat Source. Yep. Um, and I know you. S we have a couple remixes on there. And right before we started the show, someone emailed you another remix. So. Yeah, so there, there's a remix EP that's going to come out. Uh, okay. I think uh, this Friday the 21st. So. Or, oh, I guess it'll be this past Friday the 21st. The VIP remix will have come out. Okay. And... Yeah, I think there's two or three more coming. Don't wanna, don't wanna say it till we officially <laughs> announce it. But definitely some some awesome, uh, different remixes, all very playable, yeah. club ready. Dope. Are you gonna keep just pumping stuff out? Like for uh, sure. And and I want to thank everyone, all my DJ friends, and just DJs who I haven't met yet that have supported my previous releases. It's been amazing. Yeah. Uh, the support. You know, none of them have gone huge yet. None of my songs, but. People are playing them and tagging me in it when they play it, and it's unbelievable. It's yeah. unreal. Yeah, like I said, we went out last night. We were with our friend, and he's like, I played your song on Saturday night. You're like, what? I didn't even know that. Yeah, it was, it's it's amazing. It's so cool. Um, so that's the best. I mean, that's the thing with, like, we love open format DJing or whatever you want to call it, you know, just DJing as a whole. But, I mean, the music production, I think, is, is just that thing that could take – Take your career to the next level, but also help you connect with people on a different level. You For know, sure. um, I think the DJing can do that. But, uh, you know, if you're into music production, I think it's something to really. Put yeah, it's your dope. Time I mean, to. it's such a cool, unique honor and privilege to get to control the, you know, the entire vibe of a room. All these people come out. Right. It's the one thing they're going to do that weekend is like go have it one night out. Yeah. Like you get to decide exactly what they hear and dance to for the whole night. Like that's already so crazy. It's such a cool concept and thing that we get to right. do. Right. So, you know, getting to like slip my own records in there, you know, into the mix and keep a dance floor going and keep people vibing and watch them sh shazam it and shit. It's unreal. Yeah. It's unreal. Yeah. It's dope. You know, it's like a beat that you started on a plane or like in bed or wherever, you know, that, you know, ended up getting better and better. And then you write a song with someone. Yeah, it's crazy. And then they sing it. And it's like, I can't sing, but I'm like learning to, you know, I've been, you know, co-writing all my songs and it's, it's the coolest thing ever. It's like yeah. you come up with an idea of a word or you like whatever. And then someone sings it beautifully and then it comes out into the world and people listen to it. Like, yeah, I know. And then they do what they will with it. Like we, I was showing you last night, the, um, oh yeah. there's like these Korean dance crew that like made this whole routine to this uh, Fetty Wap 679 remix that I did. And like, I remember thinking, oh, I'm going to put this bass hit here. I'm going to copy it three times. I'm going to make this go backwards. I'm going to take this synth hit. And then watching them, they're dancing to each thing is like, that's crazy. I'm like touching these people 
and the complete other oh, side oh, of the world. You know, I'm, am I getting a call? Oh, we're getting we're getting we're phone calls? calls. We're getting uh, someone call them. <laughs> we, let's have some uh, radio call number dot. nine. Caller number nine, you're going to win the new DJ Equal Single. Sweatband. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> we got to we got to hook that phone up to um, the podcast thing. Have people call. Um, see see what they could win. They could win this Beat Source cup right here. Okay. We're giving these away. We should do that. Um, no, but it's so dope. Exactly. Like we played together at Sunset at the edition a mm-hmm. few weeks ago, and you dropped, I think, two or three of your songs within your set, and it kept the dance floor going the whole time, which that's is the coolest thing, that's man. the best. Yeah. If you it. can do that. Same with just making edits and all that stuff. I, I still um, can't believe, like, when one person has heard a song that I've done, <laughs> I still, know it's just like it's still crazy to me. Like I know. you took the time out of your day to listen to my song, and that is amazing. Yeah, I know exactly. That's I like to try to tell people that when I meet them, but then I don't want to see. To listen like, to my song, yo, I'm listen spider. to equal song. Oh yeah, no, I try to tell them. I've, tell I've them. heard their stuff and try to show them I oh, actually listen to absolutely. it. Absolutely, know, like to like because I know how good it feels, and I'm being genuine. You know, if I really like it. Yeah, and usually people won't bring up hearing it if they thought it sucked. Yes, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> or if I didn't bring it up, I just forgot. Sorry, I didn't think it sucked. <laughs> um, dope, dope. Well, um, you got um, any other stuff coming up you want to talk about? Yeah, I mean, there's talk there, about for sure. Um, more music on the way. Tight, tight. You know, everything everything is available on every platform imaginable. Yeah. And my Oh, day- yo, I wanted to ask you before we get yes. out of here, though. Um, so we have gotten to some nerdy topics on here for mm. DJs, which other DJs seem to enjoy, mm. and I do too, and I've learned a lot from it. Um, and music organization has been one of the things. Oh, cool. What's that? <laughs> okay, that's what I was wondering. Are you organized, or are you just straight no. all over the place? I am all over the place. So do you make crates, like, for the gig or for the genre, or, like, what's... Do you have any sort of yeah, technique? Yeah, no, absolutely. What, I- what do you do? For for nightclub DJing, I have these huge crates that are pretty much just uh, like my history from good nights at clubs. Right. And I'll trim the top, I'll trim the warm up set and like the closing set off of it. Right. And just do all the, you know, the straight meat and potatoes yeah. of rocking the peak hour stuff. Totally. And there's sub crates of that. So if I'm, you know, if I have a brain fart and I'm like, I don't even remember what hits I'm forgetting to play, I can check a crate. Yeah. And see, and I, I'm also. I clear my history every before every single gig. Really? Every single time. Why? So that n- if I've already played a song, it'll be highlighted. Do you know what I'm saying? Wait, what? I clear my, like... You clear the actual history, history. of the old gigs? No, I just, I-, I just clear the history button on Serato so that everything... Nothing is highlighted blue from being played previously or green or whatever. Oh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. You clear the... I, right. I know a lot of people don't do that, but... No, I don't do that. I like to see. But then I get stuck in playing the ones that are lit up. It's almost like the white ones start to not even be anything to me. For sure. But yeah, for nightclub stuff, I don't really, you know, I, I just freestyle it, just feel it out because you never know if there's, an, if there's a situation and there's an opening DJ, you know, I, I, I try not to play off what the opener's been, been doing and, and reset the room no matter what. Yeah. Um, but for more specialty type gigs and like gigs that are more like equal to producer based, like the sunset at edition gig yeah, that we did together, right. that one I had, you know, I'll build like a, a temporary crate of things that I think I might want to go into, but then I'll go back to, a, you know, a more of like a master vibey crate or, you know, house music crate or whatever it is, um, to go into my, you know, my special routines for whatever the, right. the genre or yeah, the style of the night is. For sure. But I don't have, like, I see some people's crates and they're so meticulously organized. I know, it's crazy. And I'm like, what do I have to do to get you to do that for my computer? Because, <laughs> but then would even you like even getting use rid it? of songs, like, have you ever tried to go through your iTunes? Oh, it stuff? takes forever. Yeah. But I'm like, I'm not, I don't even get to A track and the A's. And I'm like, I have to take a break. I know. And, my and eyes start two closing. Years ago. I'm like, oh yeah. God, I'm falling asleep. No, but do you, would you even use it? Like, what would you do? Just type in hip hop. Like, I don't know. I mean, well, sometimes, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I want to get to the point where I can do that. Like in Vegas this Friday, I was like, all right, shit. Like I was pretty organized. I did good, but I wasn't as much as I want to be, you know, like to be able to search big room hip hop or, exactly. you know, because it's there's a difference too. Like I can't play those new songs in a big, huge room in Vegas or in a casino, you know, like 
it has to be known for in sure. A way. So no, I, I have crates like that. I have like the super, just like these are the big, these hitters. are the, literally, you know, the most essential 100 songs on my yeah. laptop, you know, in case of emergency, play something from here. Yeah. And like you travel a ton, like we said, as a DJ, you have any, um, travel tips for DJs out there? For sure. Drink water. Boom. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Does that save your life? Water? For sure. <laughs> from drinking or just from flying around? Everything. Yeah, you, that's you, you need it for flying. You need it for the hangover. You need it to prevent the hangover. You need true. it for the energy to do the gig. Okay. It's pretty much everything. That's it? Anything water? else? Just water? <laughs> uh, eat healthy. Eat right. Exercise. See that's the city, right. See the cities that you travel to. Hang out with the local DJ. Get him to show you his favorite things to do in the city. You yeah, may, you you may never return there, so like you might as well see it through a local's eyes. Yeah, and I guess I, I especially mean that for international, but but domestically too. You know, oh for sure, I'll go anywhere. I'll be in Nebraska. It's, it's worth like, it, even if you only have an hour to yeah, kill. Take me to the best restaurant here. You for know. sure, hundred percent. Always the best restaurant. I always ask to go to the best restaurant. Yes, and I love linking up with like the openers or or anybody that lives there. Other DJ homies, you know, that just kind of hundred percent show me around. Like go to Nashville, link up with Case Bloom. You know, shout to him. He like. Yeah, it's just, that's the best. They know the food. They know if you need to get this, that, whatever. And, you, know. you know, like we were talking about earlier, at the end of the day, it's like, this is the coolest, if you love music, this is the coolest job ever. It's like, yeah, it's, yeah. It's we unreal. were talking you're, about you're, not at, taking it for granted. Yeah. And, and um, just the fact that we're, we're, we live in LA, you're from New York, like, we get to be around a lot of stuff, so you can get jaded or take it for granted. But I mean, I don't know. You were saying something earlier that well, um, just that like even at the in your worst moment, you lose a big gig or like you have a bad night or it's a slow night or someone's being shitty to you. You're getting paid to play music. Like, yeah, how cool is that? Like, yeah, that never gets old. Exactly, like, that's you the coolest thing ever. Keep perspective. Not take that for granted. So also, as far as like the traveling thing, tips you get the chance to go to some crazy place or just out of your hometown even and have the opportunity to have someone show you around yeah. who's been there forever, who knows the coolest things and will introduce you to the coolest people and take you to the cool after party and take you to the late night taco spot or the late night shawarma spot yeah. or whatever it is. You know right. what I'm saying? And so, yeah, that's definitely my main, those are my two tips, drink water and, and hang out with the locals. Yeah, and keep perspective. And tur turn on lucky. the radio. <laughs> turn on the radio in the taxi. I know, that's crazy. Like, the radio still, it's not as much as it used to be, but can be so regional and give you, like, an idea of what is big there or, you know. 100%. Uh, I was in Singapore, and the driver who picked me up for the club yeah. was listening to, like, a M Malaysian classic rock station. And I heard the most fire track ever. And I was like, oh my God, I'm about to sample this and it's going to be the best ever. What it sh it, nothing showed up on Shazam. I like re remembered the radio station, like numbers or whatever, went online, found the radio station, barely any online presence. They had a Facebook fan page with like 30 followers. Yeah. And I'm like, started writing to him. I'm like, hi, I was listening <laughs> to your station at approximately this time. Can you please, you know, it never got back to me, but. Oh, long story long. Listen to the radio. That was anticlimactic. I thought uh, I thought you're gonna find and the song. Forget you're my still, love. You're still samples <laughs> the Malaysian classic. <laughs> you're still searching for the song. I'm st I'm still searching. That's for sure. Just to go back to Singapore. Um. <laughs> well, you've told us a lot of things. You've told us to drink water. Yep. You've told us about your forget my love, all about living in New York, Asheville, L.A. You're um, we really appreciate having you on. Is there anything else you need to share with the Beat Source listeners out there or advice to kind of up-and-coming DJs or people just kind of doing their thing? Uh, what I'd like to share with the Beat Source listeners is thank you for maybe checking out my music. It means <laughs> yes. the world to me. That's Ad good. Advice, do what you love, do it with all you got. I love it. Thank you, DJ Spider. Thank you, DJ thank you. Equal. Thank you, Beat Source. Yes, thank you to Beat Source. Okay, dope. Well, thank you for coming on the 20 podcast. We really appreciate it. Yo, let me get some crazy crowd cheering. Okay, well, yo, let's see if the crowd's still here. Hey, you guys, come back in. You guys feel All right. Me? Oh, shit, that? they're all coming back. Oh, here oh, they wait, come. I don't hear them. All right, so How give it up that? for DJ Equal, everybody. Thanks, guys. Oh, shit, we got oh. sirens. 
All right, he's here, guys. Yo, the 20 podcast is produced by Beat Source. Join us next week for more interviews as we discuss music that matters to DJs. Peace. Peace. See you next week.